On the 7th of June 2020, protesters violently pulled down the statue of former English merchant and slave trader Edward Colston, erected in 1895 in the city centre of Bristol, UK, to commemorate his civic philanthropy. The plinth that raised his sculpture above head height was mounted by protesters who blindfolded the statue, lassoed ropes around its head and hauled it to the ground where it was subsequently trampled. Inspired by the actions of the Black Lives Matter movement, one protester placed his knee on its neck, mimicking the actions of American police officer Derek, Derek Chauvin as he unlawfully killed the black US citizen George Floyd during arrest. The sculpture of Colston was then hauled across the city and thrown into Bristol Harbour, symbolically reprising the fate of many of the victims of the transatlantic slave trade. The reactionary media decried this as an act of mindless vandalism. The statue was eventually retrieved from the water and is now protected in safe storage, awaiting a secure future in an as-yet-to-be-determined museum. Colston's wealth, accumulated through his involvement with the British Colonial Royal Africa Corporation, has been central to the urban development of Bristol. His name spectrally echoes through the city's schools and street names. The attack on his statue was designed to rupture the status quo and force uncomfortable questions concerning Britain's colonial history and its history of primitive accumulation back onto the cultural agenda. Within days, sister actions against similar monuments to slave owners, imperialists and racists appeared in cities across the world. Shortly, the statue of the slaver Robert Milligan was removed from outside the Museum of London Docklands. The University of Liverpool renamed a building formerly named in honour of William Gladstone, also associated with the slave trade. Before Colston, the anti-colonial Roads Must Fall protests by black students at Cape Town University, South Africa, in 2015, similarly demanded the removal of a seated statue of the British colonialist and documented white supremacist Cecil Rhodes. For the students of Cape Town University, the statue was not only an homage to an oppressive white colonialist and racist, but also a physical embodiment of the reality of institutional racism at the university. Its removal symbolised both the democratisation of a newly pluralist university, but also the fall of white privilege on campus, and perhaps the first step towards serious reparations. Infamously, the Roads Must Fall campaign has now spread to Oxford, where a statue commemorating Rhodes is displayed over the entrance to Oriel College. Rhodes used part of the wealth he personally expropriated from the colonies to establish a scholarship to allow underprivileged students from across the world to study at Oxford. Nevertheless, despite this philanthropy, numerous student actions have caused the college's governing body to vote to remove the statue, though at the time of writing, this particular Rhodes simulacra has yet to fall. Rhodes's position above the gates of Oriel College, or Colston's comfortable convalescence in a public museum rather than a watery grave, represent political questions which transcend debates over which historical figures are deemed worthy of public commemoration. These questions fundamentally cut to the core of national cultural ideology itself. Presumably in defence of a certain idea of Britishness or a British ideology, following the toppling of Colston, Counteractions were threatened by the British nationalist right against statues of progressive figures like Nelson Mandela and Mahatma Gandhi. Critical museology, such as Brian O'Doherty's seminal text Inside the White Cube, has repeatedly highlighted the ideological function of art galleries. The reception of art in the pristine whiteness and purity of modernist art galleries is designed to replicate the autonomous aesthetic experience imagined by the critics of high modernism such as Clement Greenberg. The neoclassical architecture of conventional museums and galleries, in particular their exaggerated entrance steps, is similarly, similarly designed to elevate gallery goers symbolically above the banality of everyday life. Their Doric columns render that experience into an act of veneration at the temple of culture. Sociologists like Pierre Bourdieu argue that both of these models amount to an ideological denial of the social by an exclusive and bourgeois art world. 
an art world which eludes the complex and dirty materiality of social relations to preserve an overarching curatorial program of civilization which has implicit disciplinary functions. It is beyond the scope of this paper to develop this, but there is an ingrained link between the imagined purity of the white cube and the privileging of whiteness within Western national cultural ideology. Without reference to Fanon, Said, Sishu or Baba, this logocentrism can be proved easily enough via a simple statistical analysis of the racial cultural profile of the artists in the permanent collections of Western museums and galleries. Similarly, the gallery-going public who enter Tate Britain beneath a trident-wielding statue of Britannia remain ignorant of the links between the wealth of the Tate family and the slave labour of the Caribbean sugar plantations. Art galleries can, and have been, understood through the Marxist philosopher Louis Althusser's famous concept of the ideological state apparatus. Althusser regarded the ISA as the primary mechanism for generating the docile subjectivities necessary for the reproduction of the capitalist status quo. For him, the number one ISA in developed capitalist society was the school, though the museum or art gallery also made his list under the name the cultural ISA. Althusser wrote little about art outside of a short essay on the Italian Piccolo Teatro and a brief letter in reply to the French literature lecturer André Daspre. In that letter, Althusser suggested that genuine art does not rank amongst the real ideologies but has a special relationship to ideology in that it can make us perceive ideology from the inside. A Colston specific illustration of Althusser's point might be J.M.W. Turner's painting of the slave ship of 1840, which carries a political, pedagogic, as well as aesthetic function. It was designed as an intervention to coincide with two anti-slavery conventions in London. The painting documents the inhumanity and cynicism of slave traders who would rather throw six slaves overboard to their death and collect insurance payments for them at shore rather than be burdened with their health care. At the same time, this painting also invokes a tempestuous naval sublime in a visual language which simultaneously speaks to the romantic individualist, the mercantile trader, the naval commander, and the historians of British seascapes and British imperialism. Perhaps also to the British nationalist, given Turner's own politics. In this confusion of representations of Britishness, Art can provide us with the possibility, albeit fleetingly and imperfectly, to access the conjuncture of societal relationships and their attendant ideological practices, which remain otherwise immense and unfathomable. That said, Richard Jeffrey's mawkish painting of Colston on his deathbed, painted four years after the exhibition of Turner's picture, and depicting Colston being nursed by an apparently crestfallen black servant, also demonstrates that whilst art can offer critical access to ideology, it can also be simply ideology to cure. Existing outside of the protective frame and institutional apparatus of the art world, public sculptures have always had a precarious relationship to dominant hegemonic ideology. Elevated above street level by their exaggerated plinths, their hubris is always likely to be brought back down to earth by the bathos of pigeon shit and chip wrappers and the generally anarchic and disinterested hubbub of city life. The assault on public artworks can be figured to generate a moment of what the situation is called detournement, a shock-inducing action of critical juxtaposition which not only ten turns attention on the objects otherwise normalised within the city space, but bringing their intentionality and legitimacy into question. Acts of detournement against public art highlight its implicit compensatory character and the function of public art as educative propaganda. Furthermore, such acts stake a claim for what Henri Lefebvre has simply called the right to the city, a phrase which has now been adopted by 21st century anarchist groups and urbanist protest movements. For Lefebvre, the city is a signifying whole. 
representing not only a language but also a practice. This language is developed from above, on the one hand by the acts of government and planners, but also from below through the actions, memories and lived experiences of citizens. What Lefebvre calls spatial practice always exceeds the rationalised representations of spatial order presented by governments and ideologues alike. Lefebvre's understanding of the social production of space as a dynamic spatio-temporal triad can be critically juxtaposed to the one-dimensional or ideological claim over a space embodied in the public monument or map. If a public monument is an aggressive or territorial claim over the representation of a space, then the desecration of that monument is a lesson in the de-alienation de of urban space and its reintegration back into the socials. These actions, which have a number of historical precursors, therefore function as heuristics, constituting not just determinant but a counter-pedagogy of dissensus. Any revolutionary project today, argues Lefebvre, whether utopian or realistic, must, if it is to, if it is to avoid hopeless banality, make the reappropriation of the body, in association with the reappropriation of space, into a non-negotiable part of its agenda. One notable example of this reclamation occurred in the Paris Commune of 1871. Here, the Vendôme Column was destroyed by militant communards because of its Napoleonic and imperialist connotations. The painter Gustave Corbet had called for its disassembling, argued, arguing that it was a monument devoid of all artistic value, tending to perpetuate by its expression the ideas of war and conquest of the past imperial dynasty. The inverse gesture to the toppling of the Vendon column could perhaps be located in the triumphalism surrounding the toppling of a statue of the Iraqi despot Saddam Hussein in 2003, a symbolic gesture which disguised new forms of Western militarism and imperialism. The recent destruction of the Buddhas of Bamiyan in Afghanistan by the Taliban was motivated not only by religious fundamentalism, but because of an implicit acknowledgement of the symbolic representational and ideological power of public monuments over the spaces which they exist in and preside over. The recent revival in holographic form of these Buddhas was not only a symbolic form of resistance to fascism, but a spectral reinsertion of lived and remembered space into the controlled and authoritarian circuits of represented space. The, polit the political momentum embodied in the symbolic removal of Rhodes and Colston has generated significant reformist ripples across the sector of higher education. A special edition of the Journal of the Association for Art History was published on January 22nd, 2020, calling to decolonize art history. Numerous other universities and academic disciplines are launching similar initiatives. Following these protests, UCL London have agreed to dissociate themselves from the work of eugenicist Francis Galton. Their internally commissioned report has directly led to proposals for decolonised curricula. Therefore, these global acts of sometimes violent iconoclasm against public monuments are not only helping to foreground debates around post-colonial identity, but finally, some 20 years after the Macpherson report into the murder of Stephen Lawrence, they are also leading to concrete proposals for the challenging of institutional racism and its attendant pedagogies and discourses. The symbolic blindfolding of Colston by the Black Lives Matter protesters could here find its metaphorical echo in the blindness of our schools and universities to their own structural racism and inertia to meaningful reform until this point. At the same time as the neoliberal university attempts a form of navel-gazing and reactive autocritique, pressured into creating hastily constructed decolonial, anti-colonial or post-colonial curricula to meet the demands of its increasingly woke student consumers, it would be easy to lose sight of the fact that these iconoclastic actions against statues already contain within them the seeds of an anarcho-democratic pedagogy, whose curricula could be summarised as follows. 
One, the pedagogy of pulling down statues forces a critical dialogue concerning the right to the city. Two, the pedagogy of pulling down statues contains lessons which foreground spatial histories and memories, especially regarding imperialism, imperialism, colonialism, and the naturalised histories of cities built on primitive accumulation. 3. The pedagogy of pulling down statues transforms consumer space and represented space into spaces of critical education and consciousness raising. As such, 4. Pulling down statues represents the advent of a radically expanded anarcho-democratic conception of the public university. Speaking in defence of the attacks on the Colston statue, historian David Olashoga argues that these were not the actions of mindless vandals, but the well-researched and deliberate acts of educated, intelligent and most importantly critical citizens who are no longer tolerating their exclusion from national cultural ideology. The Roads Must Fall Oxford website reads less like a protest block and more like a counter course for the Black Lives Matter movement. It remains to be seen whether the entrenched whiteness of the neoliberal university can bend far enough to meet the demands of this diverse multitude of radicalised student consumers.